When I was in high school, I didn't try out for musical theater. I was doing science. As you witnessed, if I tried out, I wouldn't have gotten the part. This was my one chance to sing in front of a thousand people. Mm. Well, now that you got me out here again, you know, I was just thinking that last month was the 50th anniversary of Richard Feynman's Nobel Prize for his work in quantum physics. And there was another significant 50th anniversary that we recently celebrated, the anniversary of Gordon Moore's visionary prediction that integrated circuits would improve exponentially. According to Intel, if your car had improved as their chips had, you'd now be driving 300,000 miles per hour. You'd be getting <laughs> 2 million miles per gallon, and that car would cost you 4 cents. <laughs> and actually, it was decades of basic research on the quantum physics of materials that set the stage for Moore's Law. But no one knew in 1965 how our digital technology was going to transform our lives. And now we're again at the beginning of an era, the quantum era, where it's particularly hard to predict where it's going to take us. Industry is rising to the challenge. Tomorrow at Caltech, we'll be hosting a quantum summit with participation by some of the companies that are currently investing in quantum technology. Companies like these are eagerly hiring quantum scientists from places like Caltech. But most likely, the really big societal impact of quantum technology is still decades away. But Feynman liked to say it's fun to imagine. So even though we know our predictions about the future are bound to be far off target, let's think about some of the things that we've imagined that might occur in our quantum future. Prediction. In the future, credit card fraud will be a distant memory. You'll carry a quantum card, which can be verified, but can't be copied. With classical bits, anything that you can read can be copied. But quantum is different. The laws of quantum physics say that qubits can't be copied. There are new possibilities for encryption. Your cue card can be validated by a legitimate merchant, but a rogue merchant wouldn't be able to copy your data. Prediction. Non-invasive quantum sensors probing the brain at the molecular scale will illuminate the foundations of consciousness. We tend to think of the brain in terms of its connectome, how the neurons are wired together, and there's great complexity there. But Feynman liked to say there's plenty of room at the bottom, and that applies to the brain as well. A lot of information processing is going on at the level of individual neurons, or even shorter distance scales. With quantum sensors, we'll be able to probe that activity with unprecedented sensitivity and resolution, and that's going to teach us things about how the brain works. Prediction. Optical telescopes sharing quantum entanglement will image distant objects with unprecedented clarity. We discovered thousands of planets in just the last few years. We'd like to be able to see what's going on there. Well, in principle, if you wanted to see an elephant on a planet which is tens of light years away, you could do so with a telescope which is as large as the Earth's orbit around the sun. That sounds like a lot to ask. But what we can imagine is an array of satellites in solar orbit, each one carrying a small telescope, but where the telescopes share entanglement. And that shared entanglement allows the many small telescopes to behave like one big telescope that can see faraway objects in very fine detail. Well, the catch is that if you really want to see an elephant on another planet, it would have to be a very, very bright elephant. <laughs> but the point is that by using entanglement, we'll be able to see more clearly. 
prediction. In the future, we will make use of solar cells that exploit quantum effects to power the Earth. Solar energy is our best hope for a sustainable power source for human civilization. But today, solar cells are not optimally efficient. We now know that some living things, some bacteria, actually make use of quantum effects to improve their light gathering efficiency. And we can learn to do the same as our knowledge of quantum materials advances. Prediction. In the future, quantum physicists who have been playing quantum games since they were three years old will not be able to understand why 20th century scientists thought quantum mechanics was weird. Our digital technology has launched a gaming culture which continues to accelerate. With quantum technologies, we'll be able to play new kinds of games that we haven't imagined before, and kids will play those games. And they'll develop a visceral understanding of quantum physics that we lack, and that will lead them to new discoveries. So, so far I've been talking about technology, but I'm not an engineer, I'm a physicist. And so what really interests me is the ways in which our advancing knowledge of quantum information can lead us to new paradigms for thinking about nature. To a physicist, what's really important about quantum computing is that we think, though we don't know this for sure, that a quantum computer would be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature. And as Krista explained, that would mean we'd be able to understand properties of complex molecules and exotic materials. But it also means we'd be able to explore fundamental physics in new ways, say by simulating the high energy collisions of elementary particles, or the quantum behavior of a black hole, or the conditions in the universe just after the Big Bang. I started out my career doing particle physics and cosmology. About 20 years ago, I changed direction in response to the opportunities in quantum information science. But we've anticipated for a while that as our understanding of quantum information gets deeper and deeper, it will connect with other areas of physics in unexpected ways. And we're seeing that happen increasingly in the last few years. I'll give you an idea of what I mean, the concept of quantum error correction. We've been hearing about how it's extremely hard to build a quantum computer. Well, what is it that's so hard about it? Well, the problem is that quantum systems, very complex quantum systems, are extremely delicate. And if we just observe such a system, we inevitably disturb it. So Dave told us about Schrodinger's poor cat, which is both alive and dead at the same time. But whenever I look at a cat, you too probably, it's always completely alive or completely dead. And we understand why that's true. It's because even though we might try to prevent it, a real cat will interact with the surroundings and the interaction with the environment in effect will observe the cat, taking a cat which is part dead and part alive to one which is definitely dead or definitely alive. And we call that process decoherence. It's the really formidable enemy of a quantum computer that we have to overcome if we're going to succeed in building one. If we're going to protect quantum information from damage so we can run a quantum computer, that means we have to almost perfectly isolate our quantum information from the outside world. And that sounds impossible because our hardware is never going to be perfect. But we've understood in principle how to do it. That's the idea of quantum error correction. And the key idea is, is that if we want to protect quantum information from damage, then we have to encode it in some very highly entangled form so that the information is actually stored in the correlations among many parts. And then the outside world will look at the parts one at a time, but by doing so won't perceive any of the encoded protected information any more than we could read that 100-page quantum book by looking at the pages one at a time. When this notion of quantum error correction was first proposed, it seemed like a theorist's dream. But we're getting to the point now where our technology allows us to start trying it out in the laboratory. 
A deep idea like quantum error correction can be expected to have many ramifications. And one thing it's been teaching us is new ways of thinking about matter, of systems of many quantum particles. My Caltech colleague, Alexei Kataev, pointed out that in a very highly entangled material, under the right conditions, a particle like an electron can split into pieces, what we call anions, which you heard about in the song. Now that sounds ridiculous. How can a fundamental particle like an electron split into parts? But in a highly entangled world, amazing things are possible. And what Kataev suggested is that we can use anions to store and process information, spreading the information among many anions, so that when the outside world looks at the anions one at a time, that information isn't revealed, and it can be protected. Now, the idea of quantum error correction is even giving us new ways of thinking about space and time. I love black holes. I mean, doesn't everybody? <laughs> How can you not love an object which is made out of nothing but pure warped space-time geometry? And dangerous objects, too, because if anyone is foolish enough to enter a black hole, you'll never escape, and you'll unavoidably be annihilated. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> well, it turns out that 40 years ago, Stephen Hawking was spending his sabbatical year at Caltech, and he spent a lot of that time thinking about quantum entanglement between the inside and the outside of a black hole, and realized that that gives rise to some deep questions, which we still don't know the answer to after 40 years. But the struggle with the puzzles having to do with black hole entanglement have led to a very audacious idea, what we call the holographic principle. And the holographic principle asserts, contrary to appearances, that all the information inside a room like this auditorium, the information carried in our brains and our cell phones and so on, is actually also available, but in a highly scrambled form that's exceedingly hard to read, on the boundary of the room, on the floors, and the wall, and the ceiling. It doesn't seem that way, and is a speculative idea, but if our current notions of quantum gravity are on the right track, it really seems to be true. And what we're beginning to appreciate is that this very scrambled encoding of information on the boundary is really an instance of quantum error correction. That the geometry in the room, say which seats in the auditorium are close to other seats, is encoded in the quantum entanglement on the boundary. So if that's correct, it means that entanglement is really the fundamental notion that underlies space that it is quantum entanglement that holds space together. Now, if that's true, it means that the quantum structure of space is something that we ought to be able to study in the laboratory. And that leads to my last prediction, the one closest to my heart, that deep insights into the quantum structure of space-time will arise from laboratory experiments studying highly entangled quantum systems. If space is really something that emerges from a highly entangled system, then we ought to be able to, on a tabletop in a laboratory at a place like Caltech, to be able to create new worlds that never existed before. So in keeping with Feynman's vision, Caltech today is aggressively pursuing quantum science. We have over 20 of our faculty now doing research exploring the entanglement frontier, this new frontier of physics. And it's important to have a whole community of people for a problem as difficult and interdisciplinary as understanding quantum information. Nobody has all of the answer. We benefit enormously from sharing our ideas with one another and forging collaborations. And that's especially true for the young people in the community, the students and postdocs who really provide the glue that holds us together. At Caltech, our quantum science community includes the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter, supported by the National Science Foundation and the Moore Foundation. 
and I'd like you to meet some of the people in IQIM now. Thanks. <laughs>